You might think that UFOs are a relatively new phenomenon, perhaps even dating back to 1947, but they actually have a surprisingly long history. Hi, I'm Juliet. Welcome to my channel where I cover myth, legend, folklore, ghost stories and weird and wonderful history in general. And today, unidentified flying objects may be older than you think. I have to confess I'm a little bit more of a sceptic about UFOs than I am about ghosts. I believe in the possibility of ghosts, even though I don't believe every ghost story I ever hear. I'm more sceptical about some of the explanations for UFOs particularly around the idea that they are aliens visiting Earth and stuff like that. Although I am open to being persuaded otherwise, uh, if there is enough evidence to suggest otherwise, but I do really enjoy stories about UFOs. Uh, this is my souvenir from my trip to Roswell, which we'll see some pictures from later. Also, I'm a child of the 90s. I have a love for Fox Mulder that is deep and true. I was so obsessed with the X-Files when I was in high school. I had a tin pencil case in high school with that picture of the friends all drinking milkshake on it, and I cut out a picture of Mulder and Scully from a magazine and taped it to the front of the pencil case. So I, I was really, really into the X-Files, and I do really enjoy stories about UFOs and aliens and so on. The other interesting thing about UFOs is, as I'm sure you know, the term technically stands for Unidentified Flying Object. And whatever we think about the explanation for an unidentified flying object, unidentified flying objects definitely do exist. People have seen things in the sky that they have been unable to identify. So there is certainly a long history of unidentified flying objects. And in some cases, as we go further back, even a history of people seeing ships and strange, mysterious, unidentified ships in the sky, which we will come to later. You've probably heard of astronomer J. Allen Hynek's famous categories of UFO encounter. He was an astronomer who was employed to investigate unidentified flying objects by the US government. Again, regardless of what we think they are, the government wants to know what an unidentified flying object is because it might be some kind of enemy aircraft or something. So he was employed to investigate them. And he came up with six categories of UFO encounter. So there's three categories of distant encounter, nocturnal lights, daylight discs, and images seen on radar screens. And then his famous three categories of close encounter. Close encounters of the first kind are UFOs seen close enough to make out some details. So not just a shape or a light in the distance, but you can see some kind of craft or disc or whatever. Close encounters of the second kind are encounters that have a physical effect of some kind. So for example, scorched trees in the area, frightened animals, cars breaking down, that kind of thing. And of course, as we know, if we've seen the Steven Spielberg movie, close encounters of the third kind are witnesses seeing occupants in or near the UFO. So they don't have to actually make contact and communicate with them, but they see beings, people, figures of some kind in or near the unidentified flying object, implying that it is some kind of craft being flown by some kind of intelligent being. So in my exploration of UFOs through history, I'm focusing primarily on close encounters and maybe the occasional disc seen in the distance. This is because although there are many, many, many historical reports of various lights, these could be almost anything, particularly if we're looking at older texts, a description of a light falling to earth, lights doing strange things. It could be ball lightning, it could be a comet or a meteor, it could be the aurora borealis. Now granted, most ancient societies do know about comets and meteors, but they don't necessarily know about ball lightning. They don't know about all the many different ways weird things can happen to light that is just to do with the physics of the earth, because they didn't know the earth was round, for one thing. I am basically just skimming the surface of these historical UFO reports, and I'm focusing on the ones that really describe some kind of object, some kind of detail, and especially, of course, close encounters of the third kind, where there's some kind of occupant in or near the object. Now, when it comes to the modern UFO phenomenon, of course, the watershed year is 1947. Lynn Picknett in the Mammoth Book of UFOs refers to the 24th of June 1947 as the day flying saucers were invented. This is not a reference to Roswell, uh, but to the Kenneth Arnold sighting at Mount Rainier in Washington. Kenneth Arnold was a private pilot looking for a missing crashed aircraft, and he saw a chain of nine peculiar looking aircraft flying near Mount Rainier too fast to be birds. 
this is quite often an explanation for UFO sightings, that it's flocks of birds with light reflecting off the bottom of them in a strange way. And in interviews, Arnold said that they were flat like a pie pan and bat shaped. And he described how they flew like a saucer would if you skipped it across water. So here is where we get the modern idea of the flying saucer, although UFOs had been described that way earlier as well. But this is the point where it really becomes very popular. And in the wake of the Kenneth Arnold sighting, we get quite a lot of stories about UFOs cropping up in various places. Most famously, of course, Roswell, New Mexico, not long afterwards. Now, there are loads of details about the various evidence around what was going on in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947 in the Mammoth Book of UFOs. There's a whole chapter dedicated to it. I'm not going to go over all of it in detail here because I'm interested in tracing these stories further back in time than the one that everybody knows. But it is worth going over some of the main details. Lynn Pitnett notes that it wasn't actually thought of as a major incident until 1978, when intelligence officer Jesse Marcel, who had been involved in investigating the debris found at Roswell, started giving interviews about it. Before that, it had largely been dismissed with the official explanation that the debris found near Roswell was a weather balloon. What had happened was, on 14th of June, Mac Brazel had found debris on his ranch near the town of Corona, which is not far from Roswell, and on the 4th of July, on the holiday weekend, he had collected up the debris and brought it to the town sheriff in Roswell on Monday the 7th. Brazel thought that it didn't look like a weather balloon, but it did look human made. The sheriff in turn reported it to the Roswell Army Air Force Base. The USAF was not formed until the following year. Now this was an Air Force Base that worked on top secret missions. People from this Air Force Base had been involved with the nuclear bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were in New Mexico in the 40s, were not far from White Sands, where Oppenheimer had been working on the atomic bomb. Everything in this area is top secret. So it's not surprising that first Mac Brazel and then the sheriff thought that they probably needed to report this find of crashed debris. It's also not surprising that there was a lot of secrecy around it. On the 8th of July, Public Information Officer Walter G. Hort, working for the Army Air Force, put out a press release saying that a flying disc had landed on a ranch near Roswell, and the newspaper the Roswell Daily Record linked this with a sighting of a flying saucer by two Roswell residents, the Wilmots, on the 2nd of July. So Mac Brazel had found the debris before Kenneth Arnold's sighting in Washington, but by the time that he brought it in and reported it, and by the time this press release was issued, the Kenneth Arnold sighting was all over the news, and a spate of UFO sightings were starting to appear. However, on the evening of the 8th of July, at a press conference, it was announced that the debris had been identified as a weather balloon. Mac Brazel thought it wasn't, but then Mac Brazel was not a member of the Air Force. Much, much later, stories started to emerge of a second crash site and the recovery of alien bodies, which may or may not have been completely dead at the time. Lynn Picknett suggests that what we have here are essentially two separate stories merged together. We have the original find by Brazel, the press release, the identification as a weather balloon, and then much later, a separate set of stories about a second crash site and alien bodies, and so on. Now, the town of Roswell has very much capitalised on the fame of this story since Marcel started giving interviews in 1978, and it became very, very famous through the 80s and especially the 90s with the X-Files, there was the Roswell TV show, there were books about it. Roswell became huge. There's a Star Trek DS9 episode about it where it turns out to be Ferengi. Here I am at one of the three museums dedicated to UFOs and aliens in Roswell, the International UFO Museum and Research Centre. Here's me in the museum. Uh, they have all these fabulous recreations of aliens matching the descriptions of the alien bodies that were found or possibly still living aliens that were found. They've got this flying saucer that actually lands and takes off while you're there, which is fun. Uh, and the whole town of Roswell is completely dominated by shops selling alien souvenirs. There's also some crystal shops. Even the parking has alien imagery near it. The town has really capitalised on its fame and I don't blame it. And I enjoyed my visit there. It's a small desert town in New Mexico. 
that's miles and miles and miles from anything else. We did a road trip around the southwest and that's when we visited. We'd been to White Sands the day before, we drove up to Roswell a couple hours away and then we drove all the way back to Dallas after our visit to Roswell. There's very little in the area. But it's a fun town to visit. We enjoyed going around all the shops, we enjoyed going around the museum. I have to confess that the impression I got from the museum was that there was probably some kind of classified research going on at the Army Air Force Base and that this is the reason for the cover-up, for the involvement of the government, for the apparent secrecy. And Pignett describes what she calls the mogul hypothesis, which does suggest that that might have been exactly what was happening. Project Mogul was a top secret project developing ways of detecting Soviet nuclear tests using high altitude balloons. In 1947, the Soviets had not yet developed nuclear weapons. Project Mogul used adapted weather balloons containing top secret equipment. The scotch tape used on their balloons was bought from a children's toy manufacturer and had pictures of flowers and other symbols on it, which explains some of the odder aspects of the debris witnesses described from Roswell with hieroglyphics, pictures of flowers, and the fact that Matt Brazel thought it wasn't a weather balloon, it was an adapted weather balloon with top secret equipment on it. This is why there's so much secrecy, and this is why there's the hasty press release on the evening of 8th of July saying it's just a weather balloon which to some extent may have been true, but wasn't the whole story. To me, this seems like the most obvious and logical explanation looking at the evidence, but obviously make your own mind up. Definitely read Picnic's chapter on it in the Mammoth Book of UFOs, where she goes into loads and loads of detail about all the evidence from Roswell. So stories of UFOs since Roswell and the Kenneth Arnold sighting have been dominated by these stories about flying saucers, about aliens, alien abductions, and so on. I'm interested in stories that predate these watershed moments in 1947. And for today, I am focusing on the unidentified flying object aspect of it. There are also, of course, lots of stories about abductions, missing time, that kind of thing, that can be traced back through stories about fairies and fairy abductions throughout the medieval and early modern periods. But those are another topic for another time. Today, I want to look at the history of stories of weird things in the sky. There were a number of stories about mysterious airships from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, around the time of the invention of the airship, when we've got the earliest first hot air balloons, then airships, and then eventually aeroplanes. For example, in November 1896, crowds in San Francisco saw a huge black cigar-shaped object pass overhead. For some reason, there's a lot of these from 1896 and 1897 in Texas, quite a few from around 1908, around Tacoma, Washington. And the New York Tribune, 21st December 1909, reported that inhabitants of Little Rock, Arkansas saw a cylindrical shaft of light. There's a particularly interesting one I want to flag up from the Houston Post, 28th April 1897. Bear this one in mind as we move backward in time. Merkel, Texas, April 26th, 1897. Some parties returning from church last night noticed a heavy object dragging along with a rope attached. They followed it until in crossing the railroad it caught on a rail. On looking up, they saw what they supposed was the airship. It was not near enough to get an idea of the dimensions. A light could be seen protruding from several windows, one bright light in front like the headlight of a locomotive. After some ten minutes, a man was seen descending the rope. He came near enough to be plainly seen. He wore a light blue sailor suit, was small in size. He stopped when he discovered parties at the anchor and cut the rope below him and sailed off in a northeast direction. The anchor is now an exhibition at the blacksmith shop of Elliot and Miller and is attracting the attention of hundreds of people. We're going to see this story again as we go backwards through time. So keep that one in your minds. Of course, another factor around this time is the publication of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. This was not the first science fiction novel describing an alien invasion. It has been one of the most popular and enduring. It became even more popular later in the 20th century after Orson Welles' infamous 1930s radio adaptation where people mistook it for a news item and thought that Martians were actually invading. And then Jeff Wayne's concept album in the 1970s and two movies, one from the 50s and one from the noughties. Jeff Wayne's concept album, Absolutely. I loved it and I was terrified of it as a child. I'm a huge fan of the album. My dad used to play it for me when I was a kid. And this image from the album art was just, I would stare at it in terrified horror and I kind of loved to be scared by it. It really freaked me out. The expression on the faces of the people absolutely freaked me out. 
but I also loved it. This story had several predictions that came true over the course of the 20th century, not the bit about Martians, but the idea of war coming to civilians as well as the military, the role of technology in warfare. It's also a forerunner of found footage horror and mockumentaries, again, not absolutely the first to do it that way, but one of the most popular and enduring, with its reportage journalism style of writing, and the main character being a journalist writing up reports for his newspaper. It also drew on the tension before World War I and between the wars of fears of invasion, fears of... Uh, particularly for Britain, which was at the height of the empire at the time, um, the fear of the possibility of invasion. Now, in the novel, the Martians appear in the sky like lights or a falling star, but when the object lands, Wells describes it as the uncovered part had the appearance of a huge cylinder caked over and its outline softened by a thick, scaly, dun-coloured incrustation. The Martians then build tripods after their arrival on Earth, and the tripods are the, the weapons with the heat ray that they then use to attack people. There's a bit in the concept album where they just kind of sit and watch the Martians build these things for ages. It's like, um, do you want to go find out what they're doing, maybe? No? Okay. Uh, anyway, the tripods are like saucers with three legs, and you can see here some of the original illustrations for the novel from 1897. So we can see that around this time, the idea of a cylindrical or possibly saucer-shaped alien craft invading is already very much present in the literature. But what about older stories from before humans were actually able to fly in a hot air balloon or other airship? There are lots of images in historical artworks that have been identified as potential UFOs. Now I have to say, I think most of them are really stylized clouds. Uh, we have to bear in mind that not all forms of art are meant to be photorealistic. They're not necessarily meant to look like exactly what things look like in life. So there's a lot of medieval images that people say, oh, this is a UFO, and I look at it and go, that is a cloud. It's a weirdly stylized cloud, but it is a cloud. Similarly, the museum in Roswell that I went to had images from indigenous rock art that it said, oh, these look like aliens. That is just a particular art style. It's a choice, an artistic choice. And they are almost certainly pictures of people, not aliens, just done in a very particular stylistic way. There are a couple of historical images that are interesting and might represent some kind of UFO. Uh, so the Madonna with San Giovannino from the late 1400s, attributed to Domenico Ghirlandaio. Uh, this has quite an interesting image that, again, might be a cloud, but if you zoom in on it, it does look, I have to be honest, kind of spaceship-like. I don't know why it would be... In, uh, in a picture of the Madonna, but it does look sort of UFO-like. Some people think that ancient Sumerian cylinder seals show UFOs, and even that the Sumerian gods were aliens. So uh, the ancient Sumerian civilization flourished thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, you know, we're talking contemporary with ancient Egypt, you know, a good couple of millennia BCE. I do remember this being in the museum as well. I went on the, on the road trip and I went to the museum with my friend Erica, who is a specialist in ancient Sumer and ancient Assyria. She has a PhD in it. And I remember we looked at the stuff in the museum and Erica said they've completely misinterpreted uh, ancient Sumerian culture and religion. Um, we can't really remember more details than that. It was 2016. It was a while ago. When you look at something like this cylinder seal, yes, it does look kind of like a spaceship. I can see what they're getting at. Uh, but the Sumerian gods were not aliens. It's their mythology and their gods and their religion. Um, I, I don't think we have any real reason to think... Uh, that they were aliens. I am, I realise, wearing a Stargate SG-1 sweater, um, but SG-1 is, is fiction, not reality. Another famous one is the Palenque astronaut. So, uh, quoting an article from National Geographic here. In 1952, Mexican archaeologist Alberto Ruiz Luye discovered the lost tomb of Knich Janab Pakal, I apologise for my pronunciation, a legendary king who ruled Palenque for 68 years, around 615 to 683 CE. The intricate sarcophagus of the jade-dressed ruler is perhaps the greatest archaeological find in the Western Hemisphere, akin to the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922. In 1968, Swiss eccentric Erich von Däniken published his best-selling work Chariots of the Gods, which included an illustration of the carved sarcophagus lid of Pakal's tomb. Däniken believed the classical Mayan work of art from Palenque depicted an ancient astronaut, or an alien who visited Earth only to be deified by the Maya. Later theories even suggested that Pakal's sarcophagus was in fact a kind of ancient spaceship. And there is a replica 
of this sarcophagus in the museum at Roswell, which you can see here. Again, I am not a believer in this particular theory, I have to confess. I think this is a particular artistic style and it is expressing things relating to Mayan religion. I don't know anything about Mayan religion. I don't think this is necessarily depicting aliens, but who knows. One of the first photographs of UFOs was taken by Mexican astronomer Jose Bonilla in 1883, where he saw a series of disks moving very fast. And this is one of the common things in reports of UFOs, say, particularly if we're thinking of them as unidentified flying objects, that people who report them, they don't know what they are, they seem to be moving too fast to be birds. Uh, they're not claiming to have an explanation for what they actually are. So as I mentioned earlier, written sources throughout history have reported lights in the sky, which could be comets, ball lightning and so on. But there are other reports that are less easy to explain as ball lightning. 24th January 1878 in the Denison, Texas Daily News, farmer John Martin said he saw a large round saucer flying overhead very fast. Again, this is way pre-Kenneth Arnold and he's already describing it as a saucer. The poet Goethe claimed in his autobiography that when he was 16, walking between Hanau and Gelhausen, he saw in a ravine a sort of amphitheatre, wonderfully illuminated. In a funnel-shaped space there were innumerable little lights gleaming, ranged step fashion over one another, and they shone so brilliantly that the eye was dazzled. But what still more confused the sight was that they did not keep still, but jumped about here and there, as well downwards from above as vice versa, and in every direction. Goethe lived 1749 to 1832, so this would have occurred kind of toward the end of the early modern period. Goethe thought they might be will-o'-the-wisps, which is a known phenomenon, uh, gaslights, marsh lights. It is also worth noting that the title of his autobiography is Autobiography, Truth and Fiction Relating to My Life. So we do have to wonder if this is from the fiction section of Truth and Fiction, but who knows? I mentioned earlier a story about an airship and an anchor, and from the medieval and early modern periods we have lots of stories about ships seen in the sky, and the description appears to imply ships as in like sailing ships, and a lot of them have anchors like sailing ships. Le Comte de Gabelli by Abbe Henri de Montfaucon de Villa claims that in Lyon, during the reign of Charlemagne, now the reign of Charlemagne is 774 to 814 CE, this book was written in 1670, so this is reporting a story from 900 years earlier. But he says, people saw three men and a woman descend from aerial ships, and also mentions people being abducted by miraculous men. This whole source is a bit dubious. But there are other reports that have more witnesses and a bit more credibility. On April 8th, 1665, around 2pm, Fishermen anchored near Barhoft, which was then in Sweden and is now in Germany, reported seeing ships in the sky battling each other. After the battle, a dark object hovered in the sky. I haven't been able to track down the actual primary source for this, uh, but this is what's widely quoted on the internet as coming from Erasmus Franciski in Der Wunderreicher Uebezug unserer Niederwelt. Uh, written in 1689. After a while, out of the sky came a flat, round form like a plate, looking like the big hat of a man. Its colour was that of the darkening moon, and it hovered right over the church of St Nikolai. There it remained stationary until the evening. The fishermen, worried to death, didn't want to look further at the spectacle, and buried their faces in their hands. On the following days they fell sick with trembling all over, and pain in head and limbs. And this idea of ships in the sky has a very long history. The Irish annals of Ulster, of Tigernach, and of Clongmacnoise, and of the Four Masters, as well as in analytic material preserved in some manuscripts of Le Bar Kabbalah, all say that in the middle of the 700s CE, ships with men aboard were seen in the air over Ireland. I apologise for my pronunciation. I am literally Irish, but I've never studied the language, so I'm trying. One of the monastic legends in the Advocates Library in Edinburgh, dating to the 14th or 15th century CE itself, so again a story written several centuries later. It says, One day the community of Clonmacnoise were assembled in conclave on the floor of the church. As they were conversing, they saw a ship sailing above them in the air, moving as if it were upon the sea. When the crew of the ship saw the conclave and the settlement below them, they cast out the anchor, and so the anchor came down onto the floor of the church so that the cleric seized it. A man from the ship came down after the anchor, swimming as if through water. But when he reached the anchor, they seized him. For God's sake, let me go, he said, for you are drowning me. Then he went from them, swimming through the air and taking the anchor with him. This links to a medieval idea that there was a sea in the sky. 
partly relating to the description in Genesis of God separating the earth from the waters. And there seems to have been this idea that there was some kind of literal ocean above us in the sky. Gervais of Tilbury, in his work Otia Imperialia, a book of marvels written about 1211 CE, mentions this story specifically as proof of the existence of an upper sea. Gervais says, in further proof of the existence of an upper sea overhead, there is a thing newly revealed in our times. Now, that's not quite accurate. This story goes back to the 700s, but still. On a feast day in Britain, interestingly, not Ireland at this period, so he means England or Wales, some people were leaving their parish church after attending mass, the weather being very cloudy and because of the density of the clouds, quite dark. There appeared the anchor of a ship fastened to a heap of stones in the circuit of the enclosure, attached to a rope stretched down from above. The people were amazed, and while they discussed it among themselves, they saw the rope move as if the crew were struggling to free the anchor. When it would not budge for all their tugging, a voice was heard in the thick air like the clamour of sailors vying to recover the thrown anchor. Nor was it long until, hope in the effectiveness of exertion having been exhausted, the sailors sent down one of themselves who, as we have heard, dangling from the anchor rope, came down it hand over hand. When he was about to disengage the anchor, he was seized by bystanders. He gasped in the hands of his captors like a man lost in a shipwreck and died suffocated by the moisture of our thicker air. But the sailors overhead, surmising that their comrade had drowned, cut the anchor rope after having waited for an hour and sailed away leaving the anchor. In memory of this occurrence, it was ingeniously decided that iron fittings for the church's door should be made from the same anchor and these are still there for all to see. We saw this much, much later in the late 19th century story. There was an anchor, there was a church, the anchor was still on display. John Carey has outlined the development of this ship in the sky dropping anchor story as follows. First, in the mid 8th century, a notice that ships had been seen in the air was included in the annals. Annals are year by year histories of a particular area, in this case, particular parts of Ireland. The apparition was subsequently localised at the assembly of Tailtiu and said to have been witnessed by the then reigning king of Tara. Second, by the late 11th century, the story had been transferred to the reign of the 10th century king Congolach Nogba and embellished with the detail of the lost and recovered fishing spear. I didn't go into that, there's a whole thing with a fishing spear in some of these stories. There was now only one airship. Third, by the end of the 12th century, the story was shifted to the monastic milieu of Clonmagnoisia and an anchor took the place of the fishing spear. So that's the version that I've been looking at, the version with the anchor. And do have a look at John Kerry's article if you have access to it for more details. So this seems to be a fascinating story about a ship in the sky dropping anchor that lasts for centuries and centuries and centuries. But it actually goes back further as well. The Irish annals from the 700s are not the first time we see a story like this, although the anchor does seem to be a bit of a later addition. We have more stories of ships in the sky from the ancient world. Now, I've not looked at the various biblical stories that are often included in lists of ancient reports of UFOs. I'm trying to focus here on unidentified or at least unexplainable flying objects. So although these stories say they were ships, they don't know who the ships are, they don't know why the ships are there, they don't know who these people are on these ships that drown in air. In the case of biblical reports, usually this is meant to be read as God, angels, some kind of divine vision. So there is an explanation in the source text for what it is, even if it has similarities with modern UFO stories. So that's why I'm not looking at those. I'm interested in things that are unidentified at the source. Even if they're seen as a ship, they don't know what ship or why it's there. A lot of the Roman versions of this story come from Livy, an historian who was writing during the reign of Emperor Augustus. Livy wrote a history of Rome that went right from legendary history up to his own day, though not all of it has survived. They come particularly from lists of prodigies. So in his history, Livy frequently lists loads and loads and loads of signs and omens that happened before significant events or during significant events, especially if it's a long war. And it'll be a whole list of, of things, weird things in the sky, strange unexplained births, any kind of omen. And he includes UFOs in some of those particularly from around the time of the Punic Wars. Round shields, weapons, stones or discs in the sky are reported in Livy six times and ships or a fleet in the sky are reported twice. We also have Julius Obsequin's Book of Prodigies, which is taken mainly from Livy and includes some sections of Livy's history that we've since lost. So we use him, he's a much later author, we use him as a source for Livy. 
And Julius Obsequens says weapons were seen in the sky in 154 BCE, statues fell from the sky in 140, and javelins fell from the sky in 106. And in 100, an orb similar to a shield seemed to be borne across the sky. So they're described variously as weapons, statues, discs, javelins, and sometimes ships. There's certainly a lot of these stories usually included among these lists of omens or prodigies. Two of the most interesting stories of Livy that seem to report close encounters of the third kind, there's a story from Rome in 218 BCE where Livy says phantom ships were seen gleaming in the sky in Rome and that in Amiternum apparitions of men in shining raiment had appeared in the distance but not drawn near to anyone. So that one's really interesting and I have to confess I am picturing men in kind of 1950s shiny space suits when he says that. Although equally it could match Christian descriptions of angels. He also says that in Hadria in 214 BCE an altar was seen in the sky and about it the forms of men in white garments. An altar obviously a kind of table shaped <laughs> Um, thing. And we also have a report from Josephus of a sighting over Judea during the Jewish war. Now Josephus took part in the Jewish war. He uh, rather infamously defected to the Romans. He'd had a dream that the Jews were going to lose and that Vespasian, who was not emperor at the time, was going to become emperor. This impressed Vespasian very much when he did become emperor uh, and Josephus then took the name Flavius, Josephus after Flavius Vespasianus and became a protege of the Emperor Vespasian. But he did participate in the Jewish war. For he says, in 65 CE over Judea, chariots were seen in the air and armed battalions hurtling through the clouds and encompassing cities. He says, on the one and twentieth day of the month Artemisius, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it. And Josephus is by far the closest to an eyewitness that we have. Livy is writing stories that took place centuries before he was writing his history. He's writing at the end of the first century BCE and a lot of the sightings took place in the 100s and 200s BCE. But Josephus was actually in this war and knew people who fought in this war. So this is the closest we get to an eyewitness account. He says, Before sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armour were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. So there's a few recurring themes here. Ships in the sky is a story with a very, very long history. Usually in ancient, medieval and early modern sources assumed to be like sailing ships. Also war. A lot of these stories take place around times of war or even feature battles going on in the sky between the ships in the sky. So in modern contexts, the Cold War, the run up to World War I, fears of enemy technology could be part of why these stories are around. Although fear of technology doesn't really explain the ancient examples, the Romans had some great technology, central heating and so on, but that's not really a theme in Roman history. For Livy, UFOs were just one of many weird and wondrous omens and prodigies that were seen around times of crisis. Omens were really important to Roman religion and Roman politics, and looking for these omens was actually a formalised part of Roman politics. Their priests were also their politicians, and they would check the omens before major events and major decisions. Though I have to say I still can't explain where this idea of ships in the sky came from. The Romans did not have an idea that there was a sea above the earth. That's not really a Roman thing particularly. Uh, they didn't think of there being some kind of ocean in the sky, so that doesn't explain it. So where this idea of sailing ships in the sky comes from, I don't know. I have no idea. Have you ever seen a UFO, an unidentified flying object? What do you think it was? Do you think UFOs are aliens or time travellers or fairies or birds or comets? I honestly don't know what they are. I think they are unidentified, but I am fascinated by the stories about them. So if you've ever seen a UFO, please do let me know in the comments. I would love to hear your stories of sightings of unidentified flying objects and I will share them in our next comments compilation video. If you enjoyed this video please do give it a like and subscribe to my channel for myth, legend, folklore, ghost stories and weird and wonderful history in general. Until next time, bye!